We are now going to begin session three, Middle Power Dilemma, Southeast Asia and the complex U.S.-China relationship. This session is going to take place in two parts. We have Laura Silver, who will share slides from a recent and fascinating Pew study. And following that, we're going to have a fireside chat diving deep into Southeast Asia with Ambassador Scott Marcial, who's on our advisory council, and Gita Wiljawan. All of our speaker bios, again, are on our website, and they're also on the printed programs on your tables. We're going to first go to Laura for her Pew presentation on comparing views of the U.S. and China in 24 countries. Laura is going to be available milling around for Q&A during the lunch break. And as a reminder, right after her presentation, we'll go into a fireside chat with Scott and Gita. Please welcome Laura. Great. Thank you all so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and share some of the data from our recent survey. Um, I have plenty more data I'm happy to speak with you about, including some of the um, work that was cited in the last panel about American views of China and how it intersects with political identity in the United States. That's not a focus of this talk, but be very happy to talk to you about it during the break or at another time. Before I get into it, I want to give you a tiny bit of background about who we are as a research center. So I, I'm based in Washington, D.C., and Pew Research Center describes itself as a fact tank. Our purpose is not advocacy. It's not to um, make changes. It's to give people a foundation of facts so that they can understand it how people around the world feel about key issues as they make policy. So I know that I have many people in this room who hopefully can be guided by these facts as you all craft the difficult policies going forward. But what we want to do is to bring the public's voice to the conversation. We're nonprofit, nonpartisan, and non-advocacy in our approach. The data I'm going to be speaking to you about today comes from our spring survey. So it was spring of last year. We're actually in the field again um, right now. But spring of last year, we did a survey in 24 countries. The mode that we use can vary, and I'm happy to answer questions about methodology. But it's important to note that whatever we do is nationally representative. So we make sure that we have a nationally representative sample in each one of the 24 countries that we surveyed so that we can make inferences um, across different groups, for example, across age groups, across gender, across party, and a number of other things. Um, most of the representation that we have is from advanced economies. I'll, I'll be speaking a little bit about high income countries, but we do have eight middle income countries um, in the 2023 survey. And I'm excited to say that at least as of right now, we're in the field in 36 countries for 2024. Um, and so we will have even more representation from the global south. As I go forward in my slides, you'll note that there are a few times when we don't have trend data for the middle income countries in 2020, 2021, and, and 2022. That's because of COVID. We still go door to door in many of these countries. And when there was a raging pandemic, we thought, let's not send interviewers to knock on people's doors. So for the safety of our interviewers and for our firms, we were not able for a few years to have full representation in the Global South, and we're excited to be resuming it. I want to start with a little bit of a discussion of favorability of the US and China. What you're looking at here is views of China um, from about half of the countries. The next slide will have the remainder. And one of the major takeaways is that views of China tend to be quite negative. That's the case in North America as well as most parts of Europe. However, there is some variation when it comes to views in middle income countries. You can see particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, views are relatively more positive, And in parts of Latin America, the same is also true. Views of China are also at or near their historic um, negative points in many of the countries that we survey. So the light green square there that you see, that's the most negative in our polling history of those particular countries. Um, the light blue would be the least unfavorable. And you can see that in many places, we have that light green square in 2023, or it's in the last handful of years. We saw a sharp uptick in terms of negative views of China in many places between 2019 and 2020. And some of that is likely due to views of how China was seen to be handling COVID, some blame placed on China for the um, introduction of COVID into the world. But that doesn't describe all of it. 
In the United States, for example, views of China had turned more negative starting in 2017. Um, in other places, issues in the bilateral relationship, for example, in um, Canada, in Sweden, and in Australia, we saw some negative movement even before COVID. Um, We've seen also intensifyingly negative views of China in some of the middle income countries as well. Um, one of the largest upticks we saw in this past survey was in India where views turned quite a bit more negative probably as the border heated up. Um, but we saw more negative increases in many of the other middle income countries as well. And again, the reason there are a gap of um, three, three years in there is because we weren't able to do some of our surveys uh, during the COVID period. So views of China are qu quite negative in many parts of the world, though relatively more positive in middle income countries, but how does this compare to views of the United States? What you're looking at here is what we internally call a bee swarm. Um, for those of us who are not necessarily as familiar with all 24 tiny flags, I will say that when you look at this online, you can hover over each one, and it not only describes what the country is, but also the individual data points. But let me explain to you how to read this. What we wanted to do was to understand the difference in views of um, the United States and China for a given country. So if you look to the very far left, you'll see that red and white flag. That's the Polish flag. The Polish flag is um, at the, the 72 point on this um, axis, where closer to the US means more favorable towards the US, and if it were on the other side, it would be more favorable to China. So what we did was we subtracted the share in Poland to have a favorable view of the United States from the favorable view of China, and they were 72 percentage points more likely to say that they had a favorable view of the US, and that's why they're at the far left of the graphic. At the far right of the graphic, that green and white flag is Nigeria. If you take it kind of holistically though, what you can see is that in most of the countries that we surveyed, views of the United States are either somewhat or quite a bit more favorable than views of China. Um, it varies somewhat, and you can be at the right side of the graphic or kind of on that zero line for two different reasons. You could be down there because you hold both countries in relatively high esteem, as is the case in Nigeria, where views of both the US and China are on balance extremely positive, or you could be down there because you don't really like either country, as is the case in Argentina, where views of both countries are somewhat middling. But if you look at the spread kind of horizontally across the axis, you see if there's a lot of variation across the countries. If they're more clustered together, it means countries tend to be seeing, um, be seeing the US and China in similar terms. So the takeaway from this one, and we'll see more uh, of this style in a moment, which is why I wanted to walk you through how to read it, but the takeaway generally is that views of the US are quite a bit more positive, particularly in high in income countries, but also to a lesser extent in all of the countries that we surveyed. But what about the international behavior of both the US and China? We asked a number of questions that did not advance, sorry. There we go. We asked a number of questions this year about global behavior. In particular, we wanted to understand whether or not people saw China as a country that interfered in the affairs of other countries, whether it contributed to peace and stability around the world, and whether or not China takes into account the interests of countries like theirs. When it comes to interfering in the affairs of other countries, you can see that on balance, more people say that China does this than that they do not. What you're looking at is the median of the 24 countries that we surveyed, but we can, we'll look at the individual data points in a moment. We also asked about contributing to peace and stability, and you can see that a 71% median say that China does not contribute to peace and stability around the world. And when it comes to taking into account the interests of countries like theirs, a 76% median across the 24 countries says that China does not do this. But how do these compare to the United States, another major global actor? Well, first, interestingly, the US is seen as much more likely to interfere in the affairs of other countries across all of the countries that we surveyed, with the potential exception of Australia, where it's not a statistically significant difference, but even there, more people are likely to say it of the US than of China. The US itself also is a little bit torn about how much we do this relative to China. But you can see that in general, both countries are seen to do this because most things are plotted near the zero point. So the US is seen as more interventionist, more likely to interfere in the affairs of other countries, um, but all, both countries are seen to do it. The countries that are most likely to say that the US interferes in the affairs of other countries, you can see on the far left there, Greece, Israel, and Italy. But the US is also seen to be contributing quite a bit more to global peace and stability in most countries that we surveyed. 
That's particularly the case among Ch some of China's neighbors. You can see that, for example, in Japan and South Korea, which are at the far left side. It's slightly, um, slightly less true in some of the middle income countries that you see closer to the midpoint of the graphic. And interestingly, many people around the world are likely to say that the US both contributes to peace and stability and interferes in the affairs of other countries. That's kind of an internally consistent viewpoint that we see quite a bit, even if it might seem contradictory on its face. And when it comes to the US considering um, countries' interests relative to China, again, we see that people in most countries are more likely to say that the US and China take into account the interests that the US rather than China takes into account the interests of other countries like theirs. This is particularly the case in Israel, but it is the case in many other countries, including some of um, the America's allies. It's a little less true when it comes to some of the middle income countries. You can see South Africa and Nigeria right on the line, for example, and the same is true of Italy. There are a number of places, though, that on balance say that the US is more likely to take into account the interests of countries like theirs. But let's turn briefly to some economic attitudes and how people around the world view the US and China when it comes to being an economic superpower. We asked specifically about which, which country is the world's leading economic power. And you can see that there is quite a bit of division on this one. This is one of the slides where we see more uh, countries leaning to the right of the graphic than some of the others. Um, in particular, we actually see advanced economies being slightly more likely to say that China is the world's leading economic power relative to the US, but with some notable exceptions. So South Korea, for example, looks like an errant dot. It's so far to the left there. Um, they are much more likely to describe the US as the world's leading economic power. And to a lesser extent, we see that in India and Japan and Israel, um, among others, Poland. Um, but on balance, views are relatively divided on this question. And interestingly, they've been shifting quite a bit. Most of the places that you see here were last surveyed in 2020, before 2023. And so what you're looking at is the relative change. And we saw that in many of the countries that we surveyed, the share who described China as the world's leading economic power fell during that time period. Part of this is likely to, related to views of the US being strong, and part of it is likely related to views that China's economy itself has weakened. In most countries, one thing we do see, though, is that people who think their own economy is in good shape are more likely to say that the US's economy is in good shape. There's some relationship between the, those two attitudes. Um, it's particularly extreme in the United States' case, of course, but it's also the case in places like Canada and Mexico, which are major trading partners, for example, as well as some of our allies. If you see your own country in good shape, you often see um, the, the US to be the stronger economic power. Here are the countries we surveyed in 2019, and the pattern is relatively similar. It's just change over one more year of time, kind of a pre-COVID measure instead of a during COVID measure. But generally speaking, what we have seen is that the sense that China is the world's leading economic power has been falling. That doesn't mean, though, that people don't welcome investment from China. Um, in fact, we asked in our middle income countries that we surveyed this past year whether or not investment from China has benefited the economy of their country. And you can see that in most places, though India and Argentina being slight, slight exceptions, in most places, people see investment from China benefiting their economy either a great deal or a fair amount. Um, they also say this of the United States, but often to a slightly lesser extent, depending on the country. But generally speaking, investment from China is quite welcome. Um, in India, the, the change in this question was severe. Um, we essentially saw relations in India uh, towards China or views deteriorate quite rapidly between 2019 and 2023 on a number of measures. I'm only gonna present two of the next slides about kind of soft power, but we did ask questions about a handful of items, including views of universities, views of the standard of living of these countries, um, and a few others. And here you can see the median share who said that, in ch that compared with other wealthy nations, China's technological advancements, universities, entertainment, standard of living, or also military power, kind of a measure of hard power, either are um, the best in the world or above average relative to other wealthy nations. Um, I'll show you how it compares to the United States in one second. But what we find on balance is that people see Chinese technological advancements 
as incredibly strong relative to other wealthy nations. Um, a median of 19% said they were the best in the world, and another 51% said that they were above average. Um, China's military power is also seen to be quite strong, but when it comes to its universities, its entertainment products, including television, music, and movies, and its standard of living, they seem to be relatively weak compared to other nations. The other part of this scale allowed people to say that they were either average, below average, or the worst in the world. And particularly when it came to entertainment and standard of living, we saw non-trivial shares say below average, not even average. But for the, the last kind of two bee swarms, that's what we call these graphics internally, I wanted to show you technology and entertainment and how China and the US compare because it's a pretty interesting juxtaposition. When it comes to Chinese technology relative to American technology, more countries in our sample, including the United States itself, are likely to describe China's technology as above average or the best relative to wealthy countries than to say the same of the United States. You can see Argentina there on the far right, but most of the dots are to the right of the midpoint, um, notable exceptions being South Korea and Israel, which are quite far to the left. The same is not true when it comes to China's entertainment products. No country in our sample believes Chinese entertainment rivals um, American entertainment or is even comp is even among like the best in the world relative to other wealthy nations. So when it comes to certain aspects of soft power, the United States does tend to be seen as somewhat dominant, but not on all aspects. Um, I'm gonna stop there and introduce the other panelists, but I am happy to answer questions about what I presented or other work that Pew Research Center does during the break. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Scott Marcial with my colleague, uh, Guy Tawiriwan, and we're gonna try to take what Laura talked about globally and talk about Southeast Asia's perspective and how Southeast Asia is trying to navigate um, this rivalry between the United States and China. Um, Gita and I go back quite a ways. When I was ambassador to Indonesia, he was trade minister. We competed over trade policy. We competed on the golf course. Gita won on both. Um, but now we're at Stanford as partners, and it's much better for me not to be competing with him. Um, anyway, I, I, just to start off, um, if you look at at Laura's slides. There was one Southeast Asian country there, Indonesia. Gita certainly can talk more about Indonesia than I can being from Indonesia. Um, but what strikes me and what I think is important for people in Washington particularly, as maybe for Beijing also, is that the Indonesian numbers, while they're slightly more favorable to China than some other countries in Southeast Asia, it highlights that in, from my perspective, in Southeast Asia, both populations and governments, they don't see the, neither, either the US or China as the great good and the other as the great evil. There's mixed views toward both the United States and toward China. And, and this is hard for folks like me who spent a lot of time in Washington thinking we were the good guys to swallow, but it's a reality. And I think it reflects a strong sense in Southeast Asia that this isn't like the Cold War. They're not going to pick sides. Nor, as sometimes the press suggests, do they consider themselves prizes to be won in some competition between the United States. And I think what happens in, in both Washington and perhaps in Beijing, although I can't speak as much to that, is there's a tendency to undervalue and underappreciate the agency that Southeast Asian countries have in their own independence, right? None of these countries, whether they're leaning a little bit more favorably toward China, toward the United States, they all very much value and are willing to fight for their independence and their freedom to choose. So they're very much in the mode of, we're not gonna get caught having to pick sides. And in fact, what we're gonna do is we're gonna work with China. It's an important partner. Where it makes sense to work with China and, and uh, where and when. And we're gonna work with the United States where and when it makes sense to work with the United States. And oh, by the way, we're gonna work with a lot of other countries as well. And there's a tendency sometimes, particularly in quick analysis or, or, or media writing, to sort of score the US-China competition in Southeast Asia 
like it's a sporting match. Like Prime Minister X just went to Beijing, so China's ahead. And then next week something else happens and now, oh, maybe the Americans are ahead. And it's, it's really important not to think of it that way. Uh, I don't think that's how Southeast Asian countries are thinking about. They're thinking, we're gonna work with all these guys with, by trying to avoid be, uh, uh, allowing any of them to have undue influence over what we decide. So that independence factor, that agency, and that ability to navigate maintaining good relations with both the United States and, and China are really important. Now, favorability ratings are important. Obviously, it's a lot easier to work more closely with the US or China if your population has favorable views toward them. But again, that tends to shift. And in my experience, the countries of Southeast Asia are very pragmatic, very adaptable, very flexible. But Gita, you're actually, unlike me, you're actually from Southeast Asia. So Happy love to, to hear here. your thoughts. And Gita, by the way, just flew in from Jakarta yesterday. So heroic effort to, <laughs> to fight through the jet lag and join us. So your thoughts? I, I think you're right, Scott. A good, a good part of the agency that talk, uh, Scott was referring to, I think, is partly historical. If we take a look at Southeast Asia, which has got about 700 million people, about $4 trillion GDP as of today. In the last 2,000 years, this region has been graced by so many variables, so many forces, so many externalities, including Hinduism for 600 years, Buddhism for 400 years, colonization, Christianity, Islam, independence. For the next six, 700 years, with very low number of casualties. If you take a look at the number of casualties by way of differences of views and opinions with regards to ethnicity, race, or religion in the last 2,000 years, not more than nine million lives lost. Compare that with Europe, about 190 million lives lost in the same period of 2,000 years. So that tells me at least that Southeast Asia is a region that has learned so well to deal with multipolarity. And being able to deal with multipolarity, I think, speaks of a high degree of agency on our part. But the question going forward is, in the context of this China-US rivalry or tension or whatever, I think it's safe to assume that we're going to be able to continue behaving pretty much the way we have in the last 2,000 years. We will move forward with some notion of optionalities in whatever fashion favorable to our very collective existence, if not individual existence. But the divergence within the region is not to be underestimated. You've got a guy that earns $72,000 a year. We call him Singapore. And you've got a couple of guys that earn about $1,000 a year. Those are Laos and Cambodia. It's not easy to get to a conclusion where Southeast Asia can actually be a cohesive middle power force in the context of this China-US you know, relations. But there is something to learn from what Singapore has done. And I'm quoting from some friends of mine in Southeast Asia here. I think a growing number of Southeast Asian countries are learning how to be more like Singapore. Singapore has embraced what is called the culture of pragmatism, the way the other nine countries have. And this is how we've been able to be cozy with each other, peaceful with each other, stable with each other, and with the rest of the world. But Singapore has also adopted and embraced the culture of principles where they've been able to distribute public goods in a beautiful manner, call it healthcare, welfare, intellect, social value, moral value. I would even argue that Singapore should be regarded as some sort of a democracy, unlike what we've been calling Singapore in the past, i.e. benign dictatorship. 
I think they've been able to give more space to the opposition, give more space to the media, but they've been damn good in distributing public goods. And this is where I think countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, the Philippines, and Vietnam, and all the others need to learn, at least at my level, and many other levels in Southeast Asia, there is a growing recognition that we should learn to be a little bit more like Singapore. Singapore, I know I'm sounding like the marketing director of Singapore, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's important for the other Southeast Asians to hear you know, my point and my view, because Singapore has learned to show that it can be the interlocutor with respect to anybody around the world. Why? Because they're equipped with the intellect and they're equipped with the eloquence. And this is something or some stuff that I think Southeast Asian countries or other Southeast Asian countries need to learn for. So the long view, I think we've got to take a view on our structural limitations. If you take a look at Southeast Asia, only two countries, two countries are above the global average when it comes to PISA ratings. PISA is basically the measurement of your lingual proficiency and STEM proficiency for the 15-year-olds. The other eight countries do not even surpass the global average. So if the other eight countries take a view on this in the next 20 to 30 years, I think there is a better chance of our becoming a better collective, cohesive middle, middle power with respect to any externality, inclusive of you know, this tension between the US and China. The second, if you take a look at the tertiary levels of education, this is where Singapore has won out also, vis-a-vis -vis the others. There is a, there is a new guy lurking in, in the back. We call that Vietnam. Vietnam has basically perfected you know, the art of copying what the Singaporeans have done, but they're going to try to perfect the art of basically being equal, if not better, than the Chinese. And this is historical. So I think the long view for Southeast Asia at the rate that we take a view on the non-tertiary and the tertiary levels of education, and we take a view on some of the economic impediments, monetarily and fiscally, just so you know, the tax ratios for most Southeast Asian countries are between 10 to 16%, well below the level of OECDs. OECD countries at about 33%. The monetary supply to GDP ratios for all Southeast Asian countries, with the exception of Singapore, is well below 100%, whereas developing economies such as the G7 and Singapore are at about 150%. So we take a view on the education, tertiary and non-tertiary, and we take a view on the monetary and fiscal limitations. I think Southeast Asia would be a wonderful place. Great. One of the things that, strike me, that strikes me when I look at Southeast Asia vis-a-vis -vis the United States and China is a lot of countries where people will say, China's our preferred economic partner. The United States is our preferred security partner. I think there's some element of truth to that. And you look at your country, Indonesia, it seems to me that Indonesia in recent years has leaned more to China economically and more to the United States. Um, I have my own thoughts about that, but curious, you know, why do you think that's been the case in Indonesia and to a certain extent in the region as a whole? I, I think partly it's, it's a bet by the incumbent government, which has been around for a little more than nine years. But I'm, I'm, I'm of the recognition that this bet has not paid off to the extent that we would have expected. And this is where you know, we go back to that earlier point where we always know how to deal with multipolarity or bipolarity or unipolarity. I think going forward, we do not have to take a view on whether we go with China or the US. We gotta take a view on the behavior of money. Money goes from one place to the other, not on the basis of ideology, not on the basis of geography, not on the basis of whether or not there are natural resources, but it's solely, predominantly, on the basis of the rule of law, right? There is a lot of money going to Singapore because the rules work, the system works, you trust the system as much as the interest rate in Singapore would have been a lot lower than what you would have been able to attain in the Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia, 
but money comes. And Singapore right now is enjoying a major dividend from what's happening in Hong Kong, what's happening in China. Vietnam is enjoying a great dividend from China, geopolitically and economically. So I think in, in, in the future, the way Southeast Asia needs to basically shape itself or reshape itself is to take on a more proactive view on the enforceability of rules and regulations. When that happens, I think we're gonna be able to benefit from this massive liquidity globally that sits around for over $100 trillion, mostly in G7 countries. And until about 24 months ago, much of this liquidity was sitting around in very low interest rate environments as much as Southeast Asia would have been a much higher interest rate environment. So that, that I think is gonna be you know, quite instrumental in shaping the narrative of Southeast Asia. Yeah, absolutely, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we've got elections coming up in November. Everybody here is very excited about them. Of course, Indonesia has elections next month. What's the impact, I'm gonna put you on the spot, what's the impact on views in Southeast Asia, the United States, if Donald Trump's elected? I think historically it's safe to assume that Southeast Asia has been more friendly with a Republican presidency in the US. Uh, that's my view and that's the view of many of my Singaporean and Filipino and Thai friends. Uh, more on the basis that the Republicans are more entrepreneurial, more business-like and Southeast Asia, to be fair, is quite a transactional region. And, and the fact that you know, it is and it has been transactional, I think a Republican presidency uh, would be perceived as being better than a Democratic presidency. I know you don't like what I'm saying, Scott, but uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not the marketing director for Trump. Is my face Trump giving here. away anything? <laughs> you, you asked me for a view, and, and I think the, the way Southeast Asia's pulse has been, I think it's been more amenable to uh, a, a Republican presidency. And let's not forget, when Ronald Reagan showed up in Bali, he was a rock star about 40 years ago. So, and and that, that, I think, set the tone for how Southeast Asia was, was gonna you know, expect more things from the US. Mm, interesting. Uh, one of the issues where the US-China rivalry really hits directly in Southeast Asia is the South China Sea. I mean, it's not fundamentally a U.S.-China issue. It's much more a China-Southeast Asia issue in which the U.S. is an external player. Uh, the Chinese would highlight that the U.S. is an external player, I should say. Uh, but here you have a case, and this goes back to your, your point earlier about despite the development of, of the countries of Southeast Asia, it still struggles in a way to, uh, because of the diversity to be a unified middle power force. So in the South China Sea, you have China very aggressively uh, pursuing its claims in uh, the exclusive economic zones of the Philippines, Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, uh, to some extent Brunei, and arguably in Indonesia, and most aggressively vis-a-vis -vis the Philippines recently. Philippines has stood quite firmly uh, over the last year uh, as a result. But the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which you know, is supposed to represent the collective wisdom and views and, uh, and political voice of Southeast Asia, has been largely silent, um, which is in a way, for those of us familiar with ASEAN, not surprising, right. but yet still really disappointing because China's claims have already been you know, completely debunked by the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, and yet, uh, China is able to really intimidate and even threaten, and in some cases use water cannons against, in this case, the Philippines, and not a word from ASEAN other than a statement sort of expressing general concern and hoping that things get better without mentioning China. So this is less a question for you and more my own comment, I suppose, but, um, this to me, it, it, again, it's not surprising because so far on the South China Sea, the countries, unless they're the ones facing the, the brunt of China's challenge directly on that particular day or week or a month, tend to kind of look the other way and hope it goes away. 
So it's, it's, it's one of the challenges for the region. How do you stand up? The Philippines, again, has been very firm o over the last year. Um, and, but even there, the Philippines is still pursuing you know, its economic relationship with China and so on. It's strengthened its relationship with the United States, but also with Japan, India, Australia, and others while continuing to pursue. But it highlights one of the challenges, I think, for Southeast Asia is the lack of ability or political will to stand up in a unified way. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Gita. I, I think it's safe to assume that there will be a continuation of activities by the Chinese whether it's reclaiming more lands or islands, uh, continuation of more development of you know, edifices uh, in, in the South China Sea. Uh, and this, the onus is really upon the claimant states to, to build their ability to get stronger economically, get more eloquent, more proactive you know, in narrating the narratives uh, until then, uh, we would be, I think, susceptible to whether or not China would respect the inter international, you know, regulatory framework. Uh, I think, as of today, most Southeast Asians believe that the code of conduct will be respected by China, uh, but but time will tell. Uh, I don't think. Things will change for the better for the claimant states if they do not take a view on some of the structural impediments that I've talked about. To the extent they're taking a view off in a positive manner, uh, I, I'm a believer, I'm, I'm optimistic that the reshaping of the narrative will go our way. Yeah, okay. I think one of the things that, that struck me um, the, you know, I referred earlier to the perception of the U.S. as more the security partner, China more the preferred economic. economic partner. Although, again, Japan, Korea, and others play very significant roles uh, as well. Um, but in my view, the, the economic side, particularly the lack of a trade policy, is the Achilles heel of the United States and Southeast Asia. And it's not about, oh, if we had a trade policy we'd win all these countries, we'd win the battle vis-a-vis -vis China. I don't mean it in that sense. But it's really hard to maintain your influence based largely on just the security relationship. Again, I don't want to suggest that there's no significant US economic engagement and influence in Southeast Asia. It's very significant. But if you look at the trends over the years, um, it's been declining in influence. If you look at another poll done by um, uh, Singaporean Institute that does an annual survey of, of ASEAN elite attitudes toward the United States, China, and a range of other issues, um, I think the numbers show about 75% see China as the most influential economic player. Um, a significant number, I think it's larger than 60%, but I'm not sure, um, are somewhat worried about that. They, they, they want to work with China, but they don't want too much of China influence. And they see the US as relatively less influential economically. So I think it's not, again, a matter of the US winning Southeast Asia. But in my view, the, the US strategic goal should be to bolster and support the efforts of every country in Southeast Asia to maintain full sovereignty and freedom of maneuver, freedom to make its own decisions, whether that's pro-US or not. And we do that by engaging consistently, building confidence in the region that we're here to stay, that we're there to stay, um, but also by upping the economic gain. And this is where um, I think uh, Danny and Elizabeth earlier talked about you know, how hard it's going to be to have a trade policy in 2024, or trade initiatives in 2024, though that's no doubt true. But this is, to me, you know, the biggest area of weakness uh, for the United States. I don't know, Gita, if you have thoughts on that, if you agree with that. On, on which part? On, on whether the lack of uh, trade initiatives, willingness to participate in trade deals, how much of a weakness that is for the U.S., how much it affects attitudes in Southeast Asia. Look, I, you were there, Scott, when I said no to TPP, right? Uh, I was 
in the government at that time who decided to basically you know, jump on the RCEP bandwagon instead of the TPP, uh, RCEP being the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Uh, in, in my view, at that time, RCEP was 18th century, whereas TPP was 22nd century, right? And in my view, when you're dealing with a paradigm that's a little too visionary, a little too advanced, Geopolitically, politically, socially, and culturally, it's more difficult to walk back. You may stumble. And I'll, I'll give you some context. In, in my discussions with some members that decided to join TPP at that time, it, it, I, I get all these fancy dandy stuff, you know, like intellectual property, government procurement, human rights, and all that. But as, as a developing country, I needed some capital to be able to sell it to the people, to be able to sell it to the parliament. And that basically boils down to whether or not there's going to be a sentence in the framing of this that there's going to be money that's going to be put on the table. We call that investment. And that's where the sentence stopped, unfortunately. Whereas with respect to TPP, sorry, with RCEP, as much as it's an 18th century paradigm, geopolitically, socially, culturally, and politically, it's easier to walk faster forward. You're less likely to stumble. Uh, I, I reckon this was not as visionary as a TPP frame, but it was easier for a country that was earning at that time $3,500 per capita per year and ASEAN earning on the average well below what Singapore earns at $72,000. I think that was what, unfortunately, my American friends didn't understand, that you know, populism could not only bite you in a developing country, but it could also bite you in a developed country. And it happened in October 2015 when Donald Trump ran. Uh, so, Trade between the US and Southeast Asia, I think, will depend on a better mutual understanding of each other, of each other's limitations. But I do believe that greater degree of trade flows will depend on greater degree of investment narratives. And this is where I, I want to just emphasize that the onus is really more upon us to reshape ourselves until and unless we take a proactive view on the enforceability of rules and regulations, we're not, going to be, we're not going to be able to get capital infusion. And to the extent that we're not getting that capital infusion from this massive liquidity which you guys own and the other G7 countries own, I don't think there's much to be expected you know, from a trade standpoint. Until then, I think Singapore will be the biggest beneficiary Singapore trades on a much larger ratio than 100% to GDP, whereas countries like Indonesia trade on a GDP, I mean, trade to GDP ratio of less than 35%. I think that number is not going to go up significantly in the next 10 years until and unless we figure out a way to attract capital. So that, that's my very you know, foundational understanding of how trade behaves. Thanks, Gator. Let's. Um turn to the audience for, for questions. If you can raise your hand, and then when I call on you, please identify yourself. Uh, back there, the gentleman with his hand up. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm Jack. I'm a supporter of Asia Society and also entrepreneur. So this question for Jida. So I, I'm just very struck by your- I can't see you. Where are you? I'm right here. Oh, OK, uh, I got it. Okay. <laughs> I'm very struck by your equanimity about the whole thing. It's, it's actually very refreshing. So I've never been to Indonesia, but I wanted to know what's it like living there with media? Because I know our, most of our perception of citizens is really driven by media, because most people don't get a chance to travel. Can you tell me a little bit about what's reality in Indonesia about media and how people perceive the world? Well, it's no different from the US. We live in a post-truth era where it's tough to separate facts from opinions. Uh, you know, we learned a thing called democracy in 1998, and we've defied the odds. Uh, you know, we, everybody thought we were going to balkanize, but I think we've stood 
you know, pretty tall uh, in the last 25 years. Uh, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's wrong to think that you know, democracy is equated to the algorithmic amplification, which is quite pervasive uh, in countries like Indonesia and also the US. Until that gets fixed, uh, I think we're gonna be exposed, all of us, at the rate that our kids spend 10 hours a day on our mobile phones. Uh, they're looking at TikTok, Instagram, and all that, where polarization of conversations is not to be underestimated. So the media, I think, has played a role in polarizing conversations uh, in places like Indonesia, the way it has in the US and many other countries around the world. Uh, the onus, I think, is upon the parents but also the regulators. But this is where I think there's a structural weakness. Uh, the, the regulators in countries like Indonesia and many others, they do not have a good understanding of how tech has actually disrupted democracy or the way we want to democratize. And, and I think uh, you know, there has been a massive democratization of information, but not a commensurate amount of democratization of ideas. This is, I think, the fallacy of you know, uh, what we're going through with the media uh, in, in some parts of the world, including Indonesia. So that makes life more spicy and interesting. Uh, that makes politics more interesting. Uh, but uh, I think we're quite exposed for quite a while. Yeah, thank you. Another question? Yes, the gentleman back there. and. It's hard to see with the lights, sorry. Okay, lady there. Hi, I'm Mary Kay Magstad. Uh, I'm with Asia Society Center on US-China Relations, and I'm also a former correspondent in China and in Southeast Asia for NPR. Um, Gita, I wanted to pick up on what you said, that Indonesia sort of leaned more toward China because it was placing a bet, but the bet hasn't paid off as had been expected. Could you elaborate <laughs> what was expected and what is- Are there, the are there any media here? They, <laughs> oh and, You're on the record. And, and, and how has that led to recalibration? And then more broadly to both of you, how are you seeing a recalibration or to what extent is there recalibration in Southeast Asia 10 years into the Belt and Road Initiative? I'll talk about the, the, the BRI, and I'll, I'll segue into your earlier part of the question. The, the BRI, I think, is a grandiose undertaking. Okay. Southeast Asia was supposed to be a beneficiary of about $171 billion worth of capital infusion. The realization thus far since 2013 has been a lot less than that. Indonesia has been the beneficiary of the first high-speed rail which I've ridden. I just came back from Indonesia. I took the liberty to ride on it twice. It's beautiful, traveling at 350 kilometers an hour. Uh, flawless, I could put a coin on the side, it doesn't fall off. Uh, but it got revised budgetarily a few times from $5 billion to $8.5 billion. Over 140 kilometers of range. So that works out to be almost $60 million per kilometer from a construction cost standpoint. You compare that with the cost per kilometer for the Shanghai-Beijing route, which is only $26 million, right? Makes you wonder, right? Is it double the cost in Indonesia because the terrain is more difficult, the topography is more difficult, or maybe the labor cost is more expensive? Not really. So I think that sense of Maybe it's a little too costly, may entail some degree of how this is not gonna to be too sustainable. I think this will draw the attention of watchdogs around the world in terms of how this needs to be reviewed, if not reshaped. The second part is the debt, right? And I'm not you know, alluding to the debt trap diplomacy here, for the project to be breaking even without maintenance and capex, it could take between 80 to 100 years, mm. right? At the very cost that you know, was involved. Now, is there a way to fix this? Absolutely. I think the way to fix this is cultural. I'm not seeing enough Indonesians going to China for schooling. 
nor am I seeing enough Chinese going to Indonesia for schooling. There's, I think, too many members of the two parts just businessing as opposed to schooling, right? I, I think there needs to be an infusion of cultural dimension in this, you know, narrative of BRI. And, and I, would, I would argue that this would apply to the other Southeast Asian countries in the context of BRI. Until then, I don't think we're gonna be able to achieve the realization of $171 billion. Uh, that was basically aspired in 2013. I, I, I Forgot the first part of the question. What was the first part? How the of the bet didn't pay off. Oh, okay. It, it goes back to my earlier point of how Southeast Asia has been very good in dealing with multi multipolarity, right? Inevitably, we're gonna recalibrate. And we're gonna have an election on the 14th of February, which I think at this rate could take us to the second round, which is gonna be on the 26th of June. Whoever comes out victoriously, I think we'll have a recalculation of how we go forward. And that means basically recalibration of how we deal with China and how we deal with the US. If I could just add on that um, broadly in Southeast Asia, my perception on BRI is that, you know, it was very warmly welcomed because maybe with the exception of Singapore, all of the countries in Southeast Asia really need infrastructure funding. I mean, that's just a fact. And a lot of the sources of infrastructure funding, World Bank, Asian Development Bank, Japan, various Japanese agencies might be good, but it takes years to move through the process. Whereas BRI offered much faster uh, and readily available packages to produce that infrastructure. So it was very appealing. Uh, and a, a lot of countries bought into it. Um, but I think if you look around the region, it's been overall, it's delivered much less than what was promised for a variety of reasons. I don't, and, and then there's also been, you know, certainly cost overruns and a number of the projects that frankly were much more beneficial for China than they were for the recipient countries. I don't think therefore everyone's turned against BRI, but there's more caution, more care being taken. Like, well, what project are we talking here? And how about if we come up with the projects that we want rather than sort of China saying, this is what we're going to do. So I, I think it's, and I think China is also adjusting uh, based on, on those realities. Um, but again, you know, it's easy to criticize BRI, but from an American perspective, what are we offering? As my old boss, Danny Russell, used to say, you can't beat something with nothing. And, and that's kind of where the US has been. Other questions? I think there were, yes, Mark? Mark Cohen again, and I didn't introduce myself before, but I am on the advisory board of the Asia Society, among other things. Uh, you, you mentioned briefly technology, and particularly in the context of high-speed rail, and there are differences, approaches, different approaches in technology and technology sharing between China and the US, uh, and there's a real open question about what is gonna be the role of Southeast Asia. Uh, are you just gonna be packaging semiconductors or are you gonna be innovating in semiconductors? Are you only going to be buying high-speed rail or are you going to be contributing to high-speed rail? Uh, Indonesia in particular is one of the largest markets for cell phones right now. Uh, and it's actually a place where foreigners are litigating patent cases, but it has a very small ecosystem and infrastructure around it. Uh, and if you really want to have agency, it's not simply about products and it's not simply about politics. The future, as you already pointed to, we should be looking at the future, is a lot of that is in technology. I wonder how you can address what you see is the region's role in that area. Yeah, you want to start? I, I, I think it's safe to assume for most parts of Southeast Asia, we're gonna be tech enabled, but we're only gonna be tech enabled to the extent of being an enabler and a user, not a creator, right? Uh, in 2021, at all the universities in the US, in STEM, there are about 6,000 something Chinese that got a PhD, 2,000 something from India, 1,000 something from South Korea, 400 something from Turkey, 82 from Indonesia, as opposed to 113 from Ghana. Ghana, okay, the West African country. So until and unless that changes, we're not gonna be a creator. 
And this is for Indonesia that represents 43% of the population of Southeast Asia, 43% of the GDP of Southeast Asia. For the next five to 10 years, we're just gonna be users and enablers of mobile phones and high-tech stuff. But I'm still very optimistic about the long view because I think if we realize that we need to get at least 1,000 or 2,000 Indonesians each year to graduate with a PhD in STEM in all the great universities in the US, Europe, China, Japan, and Australia, respectively, I think we're gonna be all right. Now, what we might miss quite a bit on is AI. AI will probably accrete to the extent of about 50 to 100 trillion dollars in the next 10 to 15 years. I think that's the cake that only the Chinese and the Americans are gonna be eating. The Southeast Asians, at best, will probably occupy two to three percent of that big cake. So the onus, again, is upon us to educate ourselves tertiarily, but also let's not forget the non-tertiary. The non-tertiary, I think, is structural for most parts of Southeast Asia at the rate that only two countries in Southeast Asia score above the global average in PISA, and those are Vietnam and Singapore. Yeah. We're just about out of time. Uh, one last question. Yes, gentleman over here. Uh, hi, gentlemen. I think uh, you really gave me some like uh, new ideas about Singapore. I mentioned about the, it's not about interest rate, but about the political stability and, and the policy of the country. So I think that's very important. I get it from the, your conversation. And then you also mentioned about the, uh, that trapped uh, to Southeast Asian country. So I can give some comments from my current experience and helping my friend to get a loan and because she really needed it for uh, his uh, her agricultural projects. So her current interest rate is 9%. And then uh, my banker friend gonna be the second um, um, loan sponsor. But he said because the first bank, uh, banker is very aggressive, so unless uh, you can pay out the first loan, then I can loan you the second loan. But the interest rate is going to be higher, <laughs> and much, much higher, so probably like a 15%. So my friend, the agricultural friend said, no, this interest rate is too high. The banker friend said, you can take a look. If you can get another loan lower than this one, you can go ahead. <laughs> so my point is here is, uh, many South Asian countries get a loan from China and uh, easily and quickly can help them do some infrastructure construction and really help them to develop their e economy. So, and um, another example is India. India also has a high-speed project, high-speed rural project. And the many, many countries, they uh, offer the bid and finally China win the bid. And fortunately, the Indian government say, hey, China, I don't like it. it we're gonna switch and then take Japan and as the, uh, the uh, tech technology and also the project uh, provider. And now the, they signed a contract with Japan and fortunately, so many years, the project is still stuck in the mud because no profit. So Japanese can get any profit from the project while they move forward. So the process is that. And for Indonesia, I think you'll still get a high-speed rural road, uh, get it built up, and the people really get a benefit from that. So I think from this point of view, uh, we still need to give China a uh, big plus because really give it a benefit. Yeah, that's my point. Thank you. I, I agree. I, I agree with you. That, and and my, my point earlier was to make the long-term frame better by way of infusing a cultural dimension. I'm not worried about that being a debt trap. Uh, a a $1.3 trillion GDP can quite easily absorb an $8.5 billion undertaking. I'm more worried about Lao being in a debt trap because the four to $5 billion spent on that massive project uh, in the context of BRI is gonna to totally expose the GDP of Laos, which is a lot less than $1.3 trillion. Yeah. 
but, but I, I, I do want to emphasize that I think the cultural dimension of BRI is somewhat overlooked. Uh, and let me just give you, you know, final comment. If you take a look at the FDI on a per capita per year basis for most countries in Southeast Asia, it hovers at around 100 to 400 dollars per capita per year, including Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Thailand. Singapore is at 19,000 dollars. Okay, you may you may you may argue that it's it's a relative number because population is so small, but their absolute number in 2021 was $105 billion worth of FDI. The second biggest recipient of FDI in Southeast Asia was Indonesia at only $30 billion. So on an absolute nominal and relative basis, Singapore is the LeBron James. And we can copycat whatever a lot of what Singapore has done to the extent we can do that, I think we're gonna be all right. And thanks, we've got to wrap up. I have to correct you on one thing. In the Bay Area, there's a Steph Curry. <laughs> All right, I made a mistake. <laughs> Steph Curry. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, and to Laura. And thank you to our sponsors of this conference. Many have been with us for six years. They're on page 20 of your program. I'd just like to give a shout out to NEA, Pang and Yum, 2002 Trust, Kenson Ventures, Silicon Valley Bank, Ken Wilcox, Lisa Berry, and James Gale. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your support for this conference. If any of you would like to be a sponsor, or to donate, or to join as a member, on the inside cover of your program, there's a QR code. Please sign up and join us. We would love to have you with us.